To pick up on uh, where we left off in, in the last part, um, there's the, we had a we wanted to discuss a little bit more about the strategy of leftists um, wanting to not vote for Biden uh, as a strategy of sending a message to the to the Democratic establishment about how they feel about uh, the Democratic Party acknowledging their their um, their desires for po their policy desires. So Dan had a question um, for Lauren on that in respect. Yeah, in respect. Well, Lauren, it seems if I'm picking up what you, you know, your level of engagement, which is really admirable and seems like it's a lot. Um, and you're like in the trench and, you know, so you said labor solidarity. And I wondered how, what was your response to Phil's um, strategy that he expressed in the last video of kind of withholding at least his vote in order to attract a more uh, ideologically pure response, specifically on Medicare for all, but in general, how does that how does that read in, in your kind of boots on the ground world? That's a really great question. I think from the standpoint of organizing for any sort of change, basically you accept increments, um, especially when it's your job. So as far as legislation goes, any small grain of rice that you would throw on the pile is seen as a win. Um, but I think that that is an organizer's perspective. I think that the pressure to apply to our leaders, um, you know, it's, it's got to be from the standpoint of this collective idea. Um, collective bargaining is the only leverage that um, leftist groups have. We don't seem to have a ton of dollars to make things move. We don't have um, land. We don't have any other mechanism to build power with at this time. And even lobbying, we are up against unprecedented times in which there is so much money being moved around by people who do hold the keys. So I think that the challenge for us and sorry, there's a lot of noise in my background. Um, but I think that the challenge for us is to ensure that we find that path forward that is inclusive, that does bring people to the table. And I don't think that it's a right or wrong approach. I think that it's whatever can be leveraged. If Bill's vote can be leveraged, then great. Um, as long as it's rolling up to some agenda that makes sense, then it, it can work. Um, but so as a strategy, no, go ahead. You mentioned inclusive path, path forward that's inclusive. Uh, like for this video example, I wanted to bring in more Republicans that are millennials who are Republican. And I know them and they exist, but <laughs> not many of them want to have their opinions put out for the world to see. And because of that, they're often left out of the conversation and the polling and the consensus. So it, it's almost like they don't exist. How do you think the path forward can bring them into the fold? I'd be interested to know what millennial Republicans are trying to achieve. Bingo. Because right. there, oh, this is right. not especially true, but it, it feels true sometimes in the rhetoric, which is sometimes these on one end or another, it feels a little more like a circle mm. um, than a, a straight line because of the kind of I don't know. There's a lot of overlapping rhetoric. And so I would be interested to hear what their, what their values were and what their end goals were right. and see how those might align with those that are expressed more on the, you know, on the left end of the spectrum. Um, because I don't fully buy into the idea that I, sometimes I've heard a lot of uh, like, uh, especially like Bernie Sanders supporters and that sort of thing, so sometimes the way that they would talk, it was almost like if, if only their position were properly explained, that people would get it and they would just want to be a part of it, um, which is, I think, typical of, you know, people who are just passionate and sort of what they feel anyway. Um, think, oh, go ahead. Well, yeah. And so and so I but I would be interested to just see if that conversation could happen, if those exposition explanations could happen 
whether or not they would find some more specifically like working class overlap um, in what they think they're going for than otherwise. I think like being in Missouri in a deep red state, um, you run into a lot of, especially millennials, young men, uh, young white males, they tend to be libertarian. And they really think that if the government just leaves us alone, that we'll be able to handle things ourselves. That the government, if whether they're giving something, there's always strings attached. Whenever um, they'll say, beware if the government comes and says, I'm here to help. So they really want to reduce the, the especially the federal government. I mean, that's pretty much a conservative view overall, but they, they're very passionate about that. And a lot of the like college ed educated right wingers they tend to be libertarian so they're like they don't necessarily identify with the republican party as much as they would identify with like just no government as little government as possible mm -hmm. yeah so how do, how do the social issues like equality social equality um gender equality how does that factor in the typical classic cultural wars abortion I think that they don't care about that. They're just like, yeah. well, we're, I'm not racist or I'm not sexist, so it doesn't matter. I, the government can't force me, force people not to be racist or sexist. I, I just think that that's yeah. how, mo that's mostly how they see things in this, this part of the country is that the government can't decide what people think. And I sound like I, I'm an apologist, but I'm not. <laughs> yeah. I, my, my understanding from the from the, a lot of the millennial, and, and that's my impression too, that a lot of millennial that identify more with the right wing are, are have this libertarian outlook. I think um, my understanding is, is that they are, they consider themselves civil libertarians and economic libertarians. And by economic libertarianism, they mean laissez-faire economics. Mm -hmm. And um Right, market, and, market, and, market and so and so I think that they my, my understanding when I talk to them is that like they're like yeah same sex marriage all that stuff that's like that that's no problem with me but also like if you wanted to address if if you wanted a government policy to address so, as something that you might see as a syst systemic um, discrimination type of thing that would be like hey that's hands off the market yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, you know d d d that that that's too much government intrusion um uh but i was i was also going to say on that point that he was making about how they just want the government to to go um mm -hmm. and and we were talking about the tea party getting co-opted whether they have these beliefs organically or whether they have these beliefs because the culture has indoctrinated into them i don't know how much these people were co-opted into the, it, it, because that's what they believed like they were they had they were aligned with the Koch brothers on wanting to destroy the federal government and and reduce it not not destroy it but they want yeah, to reduce the the federal government I'm like the so I it's like did the Koch brothers really co-opt them I mm -hmm. maybe the Co we could say the Koch brothers have the, and and the Murdochs and and their influence on the media has given them these views and to the extent their brains were or their minds were co-opted or something. But I, I wouldn't necessarily say that they, that their movement was co-opted because their movement was aligned with a lot of that libertarian ideology. Yeah, I mean, me. the way I see it, the main strain running through both, I'd say, the left and the right among millennials is it's anti-partisanship. So that's that phenomenon of seeing that mm -hmm. most identify as independents when they try to find a political ideology, usually it falls outside of that typical Republican mm -hmm. Democrat paradigm. Like it's sort of hands off. And I think that has a lot to do with political participation and how they opt to participate working from the outside instead of the inside. And I think until you have the government, which I mean, this is, I'm going to write an article about this later. It's already written, I have to tweak it a little bit. Um, but it's really that, you know, 1980s Reagan narrative that the government, and it's an ideological position that the government can't do certain things. And so the capability for it to solve certain uh, social goods was drastically, um, just sort of whittled down. And I think to that point, 
I think until the government starts to be used again as a tool to, like Phil said, it's not really, I don't think it's a particular party, like across the spectrum, expenses are super high for um, especially millennials, um, people in general. But again, housing costs are high, um, college costs, childcare. Um, we, we talk about, or I make a reference to Piketty in pretty much every other one of these videos. Um, but I think we agree on the problem. And I think if we start there with people who maybe don't ideologically agree with us, in my experience, because I worked in the um, Maryland State Legislature, and so I was sitting across the table a lot of time from activists or different groups, a lot of the time it seemed like that was a good place to start, just pointing out the practical everyday problems and then working from there. Um, Right. Well, and when you're talking about practical problems, uh, one of the things that I've noticed is that when you point out certain things, like uh, from a practical viewpoint, such as the fact that uh, power infrastructure, right. there's no reasonable way to make that a free market enterprise because it involves running a singular line to your house right? Mm -hmm. And that power infrastructure is the monopoly inherently. Like when you, when you bring that example to uh, a right winger's attention, it puts their head in a different space, right? And that's where I find usually when I'm talking with people who are more right wing, that's where we come out agreeing. Because it's like, well, I can't reliably expect competing companies to run 50 different power lines to my house. I do not want that, you know? Mm -hmm. And so what has to be done is either, uh, you know, I have to accept that this is a monopoly or I have to come up with a way of generating my own power, you know? And so, you know, what's funny is they don't like the boomer solution which the boomer solution was well let's just make them government contractors so that way they're private companies doing work for the government because they don't see that as free market so there are a lot of nuances in there but like you said about um you know coming together on the activist level like that's really where the engagement, I would be interested in seeing engagement between reasonable right-wing activist groups and the left. One thing I, I was thinking of as, as Darius was, was mentioning is I feel like there's also like perhaps maybe a bit of a cycle where Reagan seemed like he did a really good job of convincing that the country that the federal government was just in was a, a theoretically incapable the of being a force for good pretty much um oh, force for good. I, I, yeah I, I got my perception is that he said government was the problem and well well he he said government problems. was the problem but he, he said <laughs> he, he also I, it's taken a little bit out of context because he was talking about a specific situation okay. and so he, he he was saying in this I don't remember the exact wording, but he was saying in this situation, the government is the problem. And um, it's like, he wasn't okay. saying government is a problem, but he also, you know, as Darius mentioned in the previous video about, you know, the nine most terrifying words in the English language that, you know, I'm from the government and I'm here to help. <laughs> I think he, he did a good job of, of, of creating this narrative that, that it's not even theoretically possible for the federal government to be a, a force for good and, and a net positive for the country. At least the impression that I get talking about people because it's just, it's so easy to demonize the government. And then so the point I was trying to make though is that I wonder if it sets off a cycle where in order to get elected, you kind of have to agree to that premise if that's what everybody around you believes and that's what all the voters right. believe. And then if you are agreeing to that premise and that's what you believe, how likely are you to actually be able to uh, to, to even have the motivation to try to make the government a force for good, which only reinforces the premise that the government can't be a force for good, and then the, the voters, and so you have this this vicious cycle. That's yeah, a feedback loop. Um, yeah, yeah. 
Mm -hmm. Well, back to the original question, this is why I wonder, when I was thinking about an answer to the question, it was like, are millennials more leftist? And I, I almost feel like I want to say that they're more left-ish mm -hmm. than they are sort of leftist. Um, mm -hmm. Because leftism, you know, in an economic sense is, you know, it's, it's more collectivism, it's more nationalization, it's, you know, labor solidarity, like mm -hmm. Lauren pointed, pointed out and that sort of thing. Um, but I think some of the conversations like should, you know, energy infrastructure be, you know, privatized or completely like, I almost feel like that that's not an active conversation, or maybe in theory on the fringes, but that those things aren't really under, under question. Um, as much as when we're talking about millennial leftism, that we are talking about, you know, addressing sort of certain economic anxieties. And then you like the coalitional left where you have the cultural left of, you know, LGBTQ uh, uh, equality and that sort of thing. And that even among the emerging, you know, some of the millennial rightists, that's that a lot of those cultural things that ship seems to have sort of sailed you know, that only there are the evangelicals perhaps are, you know, holding on to gay rights and some of this, you know, impediments to that sort of stuff, but that in culture itself, that millennials are far more likely to be pluralistic, which I think is inherently left lefty, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. You know, on the broadest sense, you know, it's a leftism is sort of a flattening of hierarchy and that on many levels, that they don't seem interested in erecting, you know, heteronormative hierarchies as much or any of this other sort of stuff, but they are interested in retaining self-determination, which seeding that is that sort of like, I do, I need to be able to pick what happens to my life is a little more of a right leaning uh, impetus. And so, but on a lot of other measurements, they're sort of, they're kind of fine with the power company being owned by the state and they're, you know, does, does that compute to you guys? It does, yeah. Do Lauren, do you have anything to add to that? Absolutely. Um, Dan, I think you're right. Um, I think that the last 400 years of social science is largely absent from public consciousness, which basically means we are moving our goalposts as a culture, as a society, more from actual power building strategies and defending land and some of those libertarian ideas of, you know, sort of keeping what's yours as what's yours mm -hmm. um, to more- Taxation is theft. <laughs> yes, <laughs> and more to like yeah. begging for um, token acknowledgement um, from these figureheads. So I think that what happened was the Obama administration gave people um, who were sort of thirsty for those token mm -hmm. acknowledgments, like the LGBT community, you know, he just basically said, hey guys, I know you exist, you're <laughs> out there. And um, yeah. when people sort of realized that that wasn't power um, <laughs> or that wasn't mm -hmm. giving them any sort of actual <laughs> mm -hmm. um, measurable change, um, they started to become a little bit more radicalized. And so I think we're mm. seeing with the rise of AOC and um, mm -hmm. the cohort there and even Elizabeth Warren's policies, we're actually seeing a true left emerge. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that land dispossession and um, gentrification and the things that kind mm -hmm. of have more of a measurable impact on people's lives are being pushed to the center of the conversation. Whereas eight, 10 years ago, we were more just so thinking, oh, it would sure be nice if somebody acknowledged the death of Trayvon Martin <laughs> versus mm -hmm. you know there being right. actual policy. So I do think it's emergent. I don't know how quickly it can accelerate in our current climate of just straight up people not having any idea who to believe anymore. Um, or who to trust anymore, um, so, because I do uh, totally agree. I think those federal, um, those anti-Fed uh, ideas aren't um, right-wing or even libertarian. I think that there are a lot of people on the left who are anti-Fed as well. Phil, right. even in, oh, oh I'm sorry. Uh, you look like you had a point. Yeah, um, I just wanted to, to point out, because uh, 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 Lauren's talking about kind of the tokenism 
thing. And I think that, you know, from those of us who are really far left, one of the things that we worry about is that without addressing class, that what you wind up with that tokenism is something where kind of the oligarchs can do whatever they want. And it, it doesn't matter what their, you know, demography is or what their LGBTQ status is, blah, 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 as long as they're oligarchs. And that doesn't translate like a, a, a trans person who is upper class is going to have a fundamentally different human experience from a person who is trans and lower class. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's those kind, that kind of existence. I think that that's what worries the far left. And that's why you're starting to see this division with the left and liberals. You're, you're mm -hmm. starting to see a, a finer distinction because a person on the left doesn't want to be associated with the uh, liberal who is more of an individualist, but also more of a capitalist. You know, you're, you're seeing that, that playing out, and I think that you're seeing it playing out in the political discourse a lot, that what's, what's going on is that leftists are pushing forward more of the socioeconomic class aspects of politics. They're not as, and the, the far left has never been as into uh, uh, demography and identity politics as some of the more center, uh, center, left and and liberal thinkers largely because class changes your experience so much well and i think i mean this is the appeal so there's tension there it's the cross pressures between um between say your social class or your economic class and then of course your race or sexual orientation and i think right now that's the appeal of someone like um, AOC, who yeah. is perceived as being able to understand both to a much greater degree. It's that whole thing of Bernie Sanders, especially in 2016, got a lot of pushback on his campaign because a lot of his focus was, like Phil was saying, on those economic factors. But on the identity factors, he was lacking as far as his policy there. Um, whereas AOC, I mean, really, when you look at a lot of her interviews, a lot of people um, just working in my office, um, I noticed a very interesting, I guess, phenomenon where women and minorities and other people who weren't really messing with Bernie Sanders, they really like AOC. Like, they have very much have an attitude of she gets it. And I think that's very interesting. Um, well, and I, I think she, I think she does get it because she draws the two in together. And that I would agree. That's like one of Bernie's failings is that he doesn't have that experience. You know, uh, AOC, I think wasn't, she was like a, bartender before yeah. this she, that's what she did before yeah right and yeah she also worked at a nonprofit, i believe and, and she worked in new york city so yeah. i mean that that's that is it, the most dog eat dog city in the country so she does a great place to be a bartender <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Except, yeah yeah except the one corona so <laughs> right uh, dan dan or Paul, did you have a, I, I saw the wheels moving in your head. Did you have a point? Oh, yeah. You can see that? Uh, yes. <laughs> um, I was kind of going to go back to millennials are, are leftists in the context of American politics right now. And I think a lot of it is defined by, if you go back to Reagan, like what is the right and what is the left? So we may not be very leftist compared to Sweden or um, European countries, but in the American context, we're we look like 
<laughs> we look revolutionaries. like revolutionaries. Revolutionaries. Whenever we want some of the things that are just basic and that America had within the last 50, 60 years. Yeah, I mean, but also consider this, like, I, th I think, have you ever, you, you're a teacher, right? Mm -hmm. So you, you have a union, right? Mm -hmm. I think that most people, because I've, I've, I had a union in the past, and I think that you would see America hit in a very hard left if they saw what a union could do for them. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Uh, you, although, you know, I mean, people did know what unions did for them, and, and union membership declined significantly in the last, you know, 50 years. And it seemed that they kind of, in my opinion, right. it kind of but, looked like they took it lying down. Well, well but uh, that, I, to I, some I, extent. I wanna, well, well, I want to point out that baby boomer mentality and the mentality that you get from having kind of life being generally pretty good from an economic standpoint. Mm -hmm. um, I, I can see how that, uh, that makes you want to join the union left less. It makes you want to individualize yeah. more yeah. and get your way. But I think that if you had millennials, right? If you gave millennials the opportunity to work under a union, given what they've been through over the last 15 years, uh, I think that all of a sudden you would see a very hard push left because now all of a sudden uh, you're dealing with, um, like for, for my job when I was union, I was getting true percentage increases, not percent of base increases. And just that little factor of being able to be guaranteed to escape inflation as, as a mm -hmm. problem. Like, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's massive. <laughs> you know, I wanted to, I wanted to hold one, uh, hold that thought. Uh, we're about to lose uh, Lauren. So, Lauren, did you have any, anything else to add before we let you go? We're going to bring you back because I, I feel like we still need to dig into our story. I don't yeah. like how did we get to this point? And will we always be at this point? You know, we, did mm -hmm. we start off bleeding heart or, or will, will we end up using our brain? You know, that typical mm -hmm. meme. So, we're going to get into that in the next video. Until no, then. you guys, I've had a great time. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Lauren. Uh, so, Tommy, you had a, a point. Um, what was he? Oh, uh, that, that's one of the things that I, I've mentioned to the people who, and, and everybody, that are, the Bernie or Bus people that I've talked to, they hate when I bring up this point, but about the Supreme Court justices in the next four years. Uh, you know, we have Ruth Bader Ginsburg and Breyer certainly it's possible that they may not survive those four years. And, and so I hear a lot of people who their big thing is that they're allies of labor, but then I feel like they, they might be underestimating how important the Supreme Court is for defending labor rights. We just had in the last uh, couple of years, there was a, a few uh, labor decisions that were made by the Supreme Court that a lot of the labor unions criticize heavily. And um, I think that that's one of the things where I, you know, I've, I mentioned like that there's a significant chance that that labor rights can continue to get rolled back under an even farther right Supreme Court. And so maybe voting for Biden would be the, the in the best interest of, of, of the labor movement. But um, that, that, that argument has not seemed to resonate with the people that I've made it with. <laughs> well, well, that's largely because Biden is conservative. I, I mean, I've, at, yeah, at I've heard the argument day, about that. He voted for Scalia back when everybody went back when all the decisions were made 98 to zero for Supreme Court justices. And you just didn't have the partisan well, but he, Supreme but Court. But it was also yeah. when, when it came uh, when it came time for Obama to pick picks, he was mm -hmm. in the camp of don't pick somebody too liberal. Like that's the that's the whole issue is that and. I'm going to be honest, the dude doesn't seem like he's holding water. 
upstairs. Do, yeah. But do I, you, and, and, do you and, think and, that it's better off with Biden picking a, a, a Supreme Court justice or with the Federalist Society picking a Supreme Court justice with respect to labor, to, to, to labor rights? I, I don't think it makes a difference. Okay. <laughs> I, I mean, I mean, I'm, I'm going to be honest. I don't yeah, think it makes because all these other Supreme Court justices that everyone is so uh, enamored with. None of them were picked by, uh, you know, progressive beacons. They were picked by the That's same, a great the point. Same central yeah. system that, yep. you know, you're decrying. Mm -hmm. I, yeah. I haven't liked a Supreme Court justice since uh, the 60s. And I haven't even respected one since Rehnquist. So, but, I mean, but they, they do vote for labor rights when those decisions come before them. Yeah, I, I right, think, the, right. Right. yeah, I think the, the, and I, I mean, I get both of your points, but again, it's that question of, again, the Civil Rights Act, the Voting Rights Act being rolled back. Yeah. Questions like that, you know, regardless of who Biden would pick, I think, that just wouldn't happen. <laughs> so I again I get the argument as far as just Biden himself <laughs> is concerned, yeah. but frankly, I think at the point we're at, I'm not sure that it just seems to me very plain that it would be better to have him in mm -hmm. regard to a bunch of structural stuff like that point that Tommy's making, there's a certain threshold you get to where you guarantee, say, 20 years, 30 years of an unequal court. And at least for when you go to fundamental, I guess, pieces of legislation, again, like the Voting Rights Act, I don't really see much of a, a way to sort of argue that it's better, that it doesn't make a difference. Um, I mean, and also, so let me let me betray myself a little bit here. Um, I don't think the I don't think the federal government, as we know it, is going to last through the year. So okay. I, I, that that helps. <laughs> that was a hot take. Yeah, yeah. You know, we have four so minutes left, and we go vote, there. Yeah. <laughs> whether I vote for Biden or not, I don't think we're going to last through the year. Uh, I, we might not even make it to the election with the government in the format that we know it. Um, and I think that, that that coronavirus has fundamentally changed the game so much in a way that our current government can address it, that, you know, by the end of the year, we won't see this election happen, not through any act of Trump, but just because those guys are all going away. And I, and I, I think that like when you, when you have a guy like Donald Trump out there sitting there going, Hey, uh, we need the federal government to all come back to work. I think the federal government's just going to buck them. So you say they're going to all go away. What's it going to be replaced with? I don't know. And that's, that's the thing. I don't know because when I'm looking at it, I'm like, a, a lot of different things can happen. You can get, you know, people rising up and throwing them out, in which case I think you would wind up with a newer, different electoral system. Or you could get, with, with Trump trying to call, call in all of these federal, go, federal workers, I hate to say this, but they're the guys with the guns. Like the heavy duty guns. They might decide that he needs to go. Dan, do you have anything to add to that? I see you. <laughs> I mean, I, it's, it's, it's a joy just to hear just like the, the like wildness of that prediction. I don't mean <laughs> that in like, I don't, I'm, I'm smiling not because uh, I, I, I'm looking down on it, but just because like, it's just so fun to hear a big swing prediction like that. Mm -hmm. um, and um, yeah. I don't know. I mean, I what's it's interesting because there's there's overlap in what you're saying with what a lot of rightists, you know, their their feeling of like rising up against a federal government and sort of reclaiming it, like the the mode of revolt is quite similar. Um, but I, I mean, I I tend to think that even with all of our conversation about you know millennials being more leftish, 
um, that there is something very profound about Americanness that is more conservative uh, than its European counterparts. And I mean, for me, this even goes back to like the American Revolution, which was not an uprising of working class people. It was a uprising of, you know, dis disenfranchised Americans. elites. Yeah, so uh, people who were clutching to their land ownership mm -hmm. um, and had the, you know, and had the support of people who were also being taxed heavily in, in a way. So, so I, I actually, I tend to think that, uh, you know, that there is a, that there is a conservatism in American leftism and, and, and there's also an, a uh, respect and a kind of adherence to the way that the American government works that I think that they would be more inclined to remove, you know, to kind of like try the standard methods before that they would, before the, the, the apparatus would come crashing down. Thank you for joining us for part two of our conversation. And in our final segment, we'll pick up with a discussion about the Overton window in American politics and our relationship with the two-party system. Please feel free to join the conversation in the comments.